Hello, everyone. I hope everyone can hear me. Um, my name is Natalia Brizuela, and I'm the chair of the Center for Latin American Studies at Berkeley that is hosting today's conversation on Nicolás Pereda's newest feature length, Sauna. This is part of a series that we've started at the center um, showcasing work by faculty at UC Berkeley um, who are uh, either members of affiliates of the center. In the case of Nicolás, not only is he an affiliate, but he's also on our faculty advisory board. So it's extra exciting that we're doing this. And it's also exciting because I think for the first time, uh, we at class are considering um, film and art practice as a, as a form of scholarship in a way, right? Because Nicolas is a professor of filmmaking at UC Berkeley. And sometimes when we all speak about, oh, the work done at Berkeley by its faculty, we all just always imagine books or articles published in um, journals, but we actually, the campus has an, an important um, and quite robust group of faculty whose work takes other forms. So welcome everyone, thank you for joining. I'm going to briefly introduce our three speakers today. Nicolás will be in conversation with Jeffrey Scholar and um, Lázaro González. So I'll introduce the three of them, then Nicolás will speak briefly about the film and then a conversation will follow with comments by Jeffrey and Lázaro. So Nicolás Pereda is assistant professor in the Department of Film and Media Studies here at UC Berkeley. He's a filmmaker whose work explores the everyday through fractured and elliptical narratives using fiction and documentary tools. His work has been the subject of more than 30 retrospectives worldwide in venues such as the Anthology Film Archive, the Pacific Film Archive, the Toronto International Film Festival, um, and many others. He's also presented his films in most major international film festivals, um, such as Cannes, Berlin, Venice, Locarno, Toronto, and many, many others. In 2010, he was awarded the Premio Horizonte at the Venice Film Festival. In conversation with Nicolas, talking about fauna, we will have Jeffrey Scholler, who's an associate professor in the Department of Film and Media at UC Berkeley. He is a filmmaker and a scholar and writer who teaches film and video production and courses on the histories and theories of experimental avant-garde film and video art, documentary, nonfiction, third cinema, activist, and other types of counter media practices. His films have been exhibited in museums, universities, and festivals internationally, including the Art Institute of Chicago, the Whitney Museum, the Latin American Film Festival in Havana, and the National Film Theater in England. He is the author, among others, of the book, Shadows, Spectres, and Shards. And last but not least, Lázaro González, who is a PhD candidate in film and media at UC Berkeley, and a, also a filmmaker. His areas of interest include queer cinema, nonfiction storytelling, and Latin American film and media production. So thank you all for being here. And I'm passing the, the, the mic over to Nicolás. Hi, Natalia. Thanks for that introduction. And thanks, uh, Lasso and Jeffrey, for being here for this. Um, so. Fauna is a film that I made about uh, two years ago in the summer, and I I'd, I'd made I made it after I made many many films with well many many films like nine films with or eight films with this theater collective called Tagartijas Tiras al Sol. And we start they started making plays when I started making films. We're about the same age, and we've oh uh, our works have always work kind of in parallel, their, 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 their plays are uh, documentary plays. So they mix fiction and, and documentary on the stage. And I've been kind of doing that to some degree with them on, on films. And 
Faun is a peculiar film for me and a particularly important film because it's a film where they play actors, at least two of them play actors. And so I've always been interested in, in writing characters that will allow me to make portraits of the performers. So there is a sense that I want to photograph them, my friends. It's not that they're, the idea is not to transform these actors into something else, but to, to observe these actors in order to seek something closer to who they are to some degree. And so by writing characters who are professional actors it was also a way to getting closer, not from like a superficial sense of how an actor lives and things like that, but just the idea of sort of mutability of their, of, of their bodies, of their persona, which is something that they're used to constantly. So the fact that they could ask characters um, uh, act is something that is very close to what they would do in life and um, it was uh, because per perhaps also because of that because of the proximity to to the profession and their lives it was also a very um, almost cathartic experience to some degree I was interested in the fact that they not only act in st on the stage and with me and they are also obviously in other films, uh, but uh, Paco, especially one of the three of the actors, the actors acts in, in in a lot of TV shows. And so I was also starting to think about what what uh, so I think about TV for the first time in that sense. It, it always felt like something really removed. But since some people in the in my sort of group of friends were working there as well, and then I started thinking about sort of the responsibility of representation which I guess is something that is very part of what anybody that makes films at some point thinks about, um, because in a way, I mean, I guess there's some debate, but in a way, film, all filmmaking is a form of representation. And so thinking about not just general questions about who is allowed to represent and so on, but also, you know, what does the act of representation do? Um, and particularly when you're talking about subject matters that are maybe some controversial or contested or that, uh, and in this case, um, it was like, you know, the film deals a lot with um, representing violence, even if it's a film that doesn't really represent violence itself. It's a film that kind of suggests ideas about representation of violence. And uh, because not just Paco had been in in that film in that TV series Narcos Mexico, which um, is kind of something controversial, which is the worst part because it's kind of totally accepted in 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 Mexico and elsewhere. Like it's something that uh, it doesn't raise eyebrows the fact that that series exists, even though it's a series that is basically narrating through a corporation, through Netflix, so troubles of contemporary Mexico. Uh, and we seemed a bit unfazed about it. So I, I wanted to kind of talk a little bit about the, uh, that responsibility. Where does the responsibility lie in, the, in these types of representations? Uh, whether, and here asking directly towards the actors that I'm working with, whether, whether they are, what's their responsibility in the constructions of these narratives and how can we make a film that reflects upon their responsibilities as actors. And um, I mean, these are all kind of ideas that at, at the end of the day, the film is a comedy too, and like a little sort of family, little drama. It's not necessarily that it's a, it's not like a, at least not to me, like a sort of dense sort of uh, philosophical um, endeavor, but it's, uh, it's a small comedy that tries to deal with all these ideas. And Lazaro, well, also so not not this Lazaro, but uh, Gavino, whose name is Lazaro now. So uh, anyway, Gavino, um, it's a whole other story. Okay, uh, Gavino is uh, has also played a lot in in films and not TV that yeah, in TV as well actually uh, of of this type. And actually he was in a film, he was like five seconds in this film where he just had, appears and gets his head cut off called uh, El Infierno, called Hell, which was kind of one of the first films that dealt with, um, that created a kind of uh, caricature of the, 
of, of the contemporary violent moment in relation to drug cartels and military and the state and so on. And, and I, was, I always thought it was funny that he accepted these small roles or just appearing and being killed. And because he also later wrote a small, not even a book, but a little kind of like moral pamphlet for the actor, something like that, about um, morality of representation as an actor, something like that. It was kind of a, it was kind of like a little thing for young actors. But then I, um, anyway, so all of that interests me. Uh, I, I think I've changed my mind about what I feel about about that representation, where that the, the responsibility lies. I was a little bit thinking early on about uh, the responsibility being in the actor, but I kind of missed, I think, the point that really the problem is a systemic problem, like everything in the world. And it's and these people also have, I mean, they don't have jobs and they I don't pay them that well myself. And so and their plays don't give them any money. So obviously they have to rely on other things. And and I guess the same way we don't blame Amazon drivers for what Amazon has created is difficult to to also just blame the individual actors in these things and so and also less efficient as well. So I thought a lot about how the problem is more the the fact that we've allowed these multinational corporations to go in and create the systems of representation because it's it doesn't really matter anymore who is involved in directing and who's involved in anyway i'm going quite far away from my film but it's something that that has that was really lurking in the process of making this film and um, another sort of side that was important in the process of making this film was um there was a book that I was reading, or that I read several books by this Uruguayan author, Mario Lebrero, who wrote a book called Fauna. And I took from that book the, 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 the name of not just my film, but also of the characters Flora and Fauna that appear in the film. And, uh, and the, this idea of having like the sisters that go up. I do, I do it in a different way, and it's, like a, uh, it's not that important. But uh, the, his books, while there is definitely not an adaptation there. They provided me as they were kind of like an engine for generating ideas. His books are sometimes all about the mundane completely, which interests me. And sometimes they have these kind of crazy little turns of fantasy or um, a wild psychology that allowed me to perhaps allowed me to do that jump into the second part of the film, which is a lot more um, I guess a bit uh, adventurous for me. I tend to, in all my other films, perhaps not all, but the majority of my other films stay within the everyday of characters and, and, and I try to sort of solve the entire films within um, um, that sort of floor of the everyday. And I was excited about uh, sort of going to a different tone at least. And that's why the second part has like wigs and uh, things like that. And, and they're acting in the second part is a lot more um, kind of, it's not, it doesn't, it's, it's like they're rehearsing, they're not acting. It's more, uh, it's more a, a small step into the world of not exactly fantasy, but, but maybe a little bit. Yeah, I don't know if uh, it's enough as an introduction. <laughs> <clears throat> well, um, I'm, I'll pick it up. Um, uh, one of the great pleasures of um, uh, Nico's films is that uh, the formal elements of uh, the films are so um, complex and uh, foregrounded that uh, there's something very exciting to really try to think about uh, relationships between uh, form and content and uh, form as content. And in uh, Fauna, which I think may be Nico's most political film, uh, the whole question of uh, radical form 
and radical content. And of course, these uh, debates have raged since the beginning of cinema. And I think uh, Nico has jumped in in uh, really interesting ways. And I think he's, um, and in this film in particular, uh, is redefining the notion of story. And I'll be very um, excited to hear Nico talk more about his notion of story, but the, the ways in which uh, a film like Fauna uh, moves away from standard forms of uh, implotment and drama, causal motivation, and uh, the um, development of plotted climaxes and denouement, uh, and he moves the, the, uh, the narrative toward accretion. One thing comes after another. Uh, there is this and this. Uh, and so there's a sense of narrative itself as uh, a production. And I love the way the films, his films sort of go on and on and on. And they could stop at one point, they could continue as long as um, the films, uh, he, the films come up with another moment. Um, and for uh, uh, in time, itself is, is the medium of cinema. Uh, and in seeing Fauna, I think it's structured by three tempor temporal elements uh, in particular. Um, the first one is repetition. Uh, the, the, uh, another one is duration, uh, the use of the continuous shot uh, and the static shot as well. And uh, repetition plays um, a really interesting role in the film. I mean, the film is filled with repetition. Uh, and this idea that we come to see repetition as the return of the same but different. Uh, and we see this uh, in the, uh, the, the scene uh, in which I think the the, the key, one of the key lines of the film is uttered in, in the bar after Paco uh, uh, does his monologue uh, and Gabino's father says, do it again. And uh, that sense that uh, there is always more uh, to, uh, to something uh, as uh, we see it uh, over and over again. Uh, there's also the repetition uh, of the dialogue that um, Luisa is learning uh, is repeated by um, uh, her mother. And we see that in the repetition, uh, how the very same lines uh, repeated have such uh, such different resonances. Um, uh, <clears throat> and the, the use of the continuous shot in the film, uh, the ways in which um, uh, the, the film, these scenes become a document of the contingencies of time. Uh, and the, in these scenes, they move from being about something toward the experience of something. So in these long scenes, uh, we become more and more aware, uh, not just of the artifice of performance, but also uh, the dynamics that are occurring uh, in the space that this is being filmed. And so I think it's in this uh, duration that um, uh, this line between um, performance as artifice and document and the documentation of performance becomes uh, clearer and clearer. Um, uh, and what is happening in front of the camera has something to do with us as viewers in this experience. Um, Bresson, I think uh, one of the filmmakers that certainly um, 
um, began to transform notions of performance referred to this um, as being rather than seeming. Um, uh, and then the long static shot uh, that uh, is used. Uh, and I think another key uh, scene in the film is actually the opening shot in which, uh, which is shot through the windshield of, of the car and uh, everything around the camera is moving except for the camera itself and uh, the way in which the camera uh, begins to uh, uh, dislocate us as viewers um, and bringing us into another uh, way of, of uh, seeing and thinking about uh, narrative. Um, so the, those are some of the uh, the elements that um, Nico uses, uh, and he uses that to uh, tell stories from in different forms, and, and uh, the way in which this temporality moves us from kind of melodrama, uh, we see this family drama at the beginning, and then uh, it moves us into uh, a kind of TV serial mode in the performance of the Narcos of, uh, by Paco. Uh, and then we move into a kind of space of the novel. So not only are we, is, is this rethinking uh, story form, but it also is using the different uh, genres of, um, of storytelling. Uh, sort of um, uh, interchangeably and building on one another. So uh, those are some of the things about the form of the film that really have uh, uh, intrigued me and captured me. And it, I'd be interested in hearing Nico talking about some of the, the uses of these uh, temporalities. So we can either um, do that or um, uh, move on to Lazaro and come back to these questions. Maybe we'll move on to Lazaro and, and, and then let Nico um, kind of take up any of the many amazing things that you have said and that I'm sure Lazaro will say too. Yeah, exactly. Um, thank you for the invitation again. Um, as you were mentioning, Jeffrey, I think something very uh, unique and very important also in most of uh, Nico's work uh, is this intersection between fiction and documentary that is been like a, a main topic in, I mean, or main like format device in many films. But I was also thinking how Fauna in some way is transitioning to, I would say, more onirical or magical universe that I, I also was um, finding in some way in previous films such as Minotauro from uh, 2015, um, Mi Piel Luminosa from 2019. So in, in this sense, I would say that um, it's like reinforcing more this idea, idea of a storytelling, as you were mentioning, Jeffrey also, is redefining this notion of storytelling and I will also say this potentiality of like fictional universes and the performative act of being like constantly retelling an event particular story something that it also reminds me a lot of or for me it's like closer in a scope to uh, a film such as a Bishop's Bomb where I said a cool mysterious object at noon for instance in which the filmmaker is exploring these resonances of um, a sort of creative story about a boy and his teacher. So this is the first kind of uh, argument I wanted to introduce. Uh, and then, of course, I something that I think is striking in, in Fauna and is the, and you were talking about that at the beginning, Nico, as well, uh, 
how the film is like addressing the impact of narco culture on Mexican society and of course its mediatic representation. And that was also making me think um, about how, and this is more the question that I have after, um, but about how the topic or the thing of, of violence, and uh, in particular narco violence, is being like a, for a long time a, a main topic in many um, production from Mexico. I will just mention, for instance, Luis Mandoki, Voces Inocentes, Amate Escalante, Eli, Gerardo Naranjo, Miss Bala, and Carlos Volado Tratelolco, Verano del 68. Um, I was particular, particularly uh, interested in how do you also take some distance from these filmmakers and from the approaches that they are like proposing in the films. Uh, but in the same way, I, I really think it's important to, to think about how you are like creating a sort of parodic view or, or reading of this mediatic representation that for filmmakers like, for instance, Amas Calante, he are like, he said in an interview a few years ago about uh, Ellie, his film, uh, that he usually wants to explore these, thing, these things in a way that we will never see in the news. So in some way, filmmaking is a way to represent what is not represented through journalism. But in, in that uh, desire, in that direction, that is a, a, like a sort of looking for uh, indexicality or like some connection with the reality, that in your case, I think it's a little bit different because I will say the violence, the violence in your films is more like referred, it's more symbolic uh, than clearly visible, like in a film such as Haley, for instance. Um, and also, Jeffrey was mentioning it is trapped in these formal devices like long takes, also uh, the constant silence of the characters in a literal and metaphorical ways, the prevalence of dialogues or even like gestures in as a performative device and of course in the ambiguity of the um, of what happened or in the the certain ambiguity of retelling uh, the any kind of event um so that that made me think that fauna is proposing a parody of how let's say a popular show such as narcos is creating stereotypes about violence in those spaces. And in the same way, I identify here a reaction to most conventional storytelling alongside, as I was mentioning before, with a critique of how media representations could be reproducing that violence. And that's also the question that I, I, I have for later. And lastly, I want to uh, ask you as well, but like, I, I, I'm very curious about why are you deciding to represent, um, for uh, like in fauna, these uh, more like peripheral spaces. Uh, for instance, we see this travel from metropolitan areas to rural spaces, such as this mining town in in the north of Mexico, instead of the re representation of, uh, let's say. Mexico City, like something that, that we could see in very recent film, uh, films such as Gueros by Alfonso Ruiz Palacios, or even like the um, very popular uh, Alfonso Cuarón Roma. So he, for me, in this case, the journey is also mm, important because um, as you were mentioning at the beginning, uh, there is a concern about um, the mundane, the quotidian life, and but also the characters in fauna are portraying a way that are we perceive them as outsiders to this reality. Uh, well, most of my questions are related to that, but I can I can start or Jeffrey can start asking the question. I don't know how to, and then I will go back. Well, you I, I, think, up your I plate. think I think Nico has huge pile of things he yes. could address if he wants to, <laughs> unless maybe you want a specific question, but 
No, I can if you want to address some of it. I mean, yeah. unless if Jeffrey yeah. has something specific, uh, I took some notes of the things that Jeffrey was talking about. So maybe I can address some of that. Mm -hmm. um, uh, perhaps this, uh, there's a general, maybe general question about uh, storytelling and, mm -hmm. um, and maybe I can link storytelling and you didn't mention exactly character development but i think think those things are perhaps somewhat linked and um, and okay I'll, I'll talk a little bit about the sort of the, the general conception of story in this particular film but also in other films of mine which has to do with not thinking things too much as having a uh, a very clear, concrete beginning and a, never, and a clear, concrete end. Uh, and also not to think about story as one story, but the, po the possibilities of multiple stories. Mm -hmm. So the, the idea that what's exciting about storytelling for me has to do more with the micro and not for to the, not the sort of the general. Uh, I don't know if... Um, uh, even, even though the film starts at a very particular place and it's very much like a start of a film in that, you know, it's like the beginning, it's like a road trip and you, you know, they're going places and they're, you know, they, you, you have a sense that they left somewhere and they're, they're going somewhere else. My idea in a way is that um, the past, who these people are, is extremely important in the sense that, um, they are these outsiders to this new space, but at the same time, there's very little clues of who they are beyond that. So uh, you can sense, hopefully, that they're not locals at all. In this, I mean, that's why they're they're totally lost and they are a bit fearful of getting off the car. Um, but beyond that, there is very little knowledge about who they are and what their past is and about uh, sort of trying to understand them. So I link these ideas of character development and story because I feel that uh, they're both generally dealt with through causal relationships, which is something that Jeffrey also brought up. And I'm, I, oh, I'm always sort of reluctant of causality, even though obviously working things backwards you can find causality easily in the films right because um it's like anything it's really easy to find causality in ev in ev anything in life if you if you work things backwards uh, like to figure out why one ends up where one is in life is fairly easy if you think about it where you are and then you look backwards but it's very difficult but that doesn't really help us to predict the future exactly which then makes you wonder about causality as well because if things are so clear towards towards the, what come be, be, before um then we should be a little bit more cunning and be able to figure out what's coming next i guess but in a way we are always surprised about what comes next luckily i guess uh, i was talking actually recently and i linked this a little bit to acting as well perhaps uh, and maybe directing actors, something a bit more practical. But I was talking to one of the actors of the films the other day, and he went to an audition, and they had sent him, I think, the entire entire book that was being adapted for the film. I just spoke to him last week about this, and it was kind of funny because he said that they asked him right away at the in, in this audition whether he had read the book that they had sent, and he didn't read it because of, he was lazy, obviously. But he told them that he didn't read it because he thinks that if he knows what happens later, then he will act in relation to that, right? That he would, um, that by knowing where the character ends up, then that will taint the present. And we will always behave, let's say, differently if we knew our future. And then talking about this, I told him that you can extend that thought towards the past as well. Because even though this idea of the future is more obvious. The fact that, okay, if we knew exactly where we, what happened in the future, maybe we would try to modify it now. Uh, but what's, what's funny, I think, what's more interesting to me is the fact that even if we try to do that exercise towards the past, like if we try to understand our, 
our universes uh, growing up or or up to the point that we're now that doesn't necessarily inform who we are unless maybe you have to go through a very complicated psychoanalytic process that might kind of help you a little bit into the understanding of who you are and so on but by but generally characters let's say don't go through that super complex process but it's um, the idea of character development tends to be linked to um to very sort of specific situations that have happened in the past of a character that you're not um you know that happened before a film starts let's say so i try to dismiss a lot these type of ideas of who are these people who uh, what has happened what happened in their childhood that define who they are now what kind of things they did in their past that have defined their characters and so on because i think they they tend to be if not outrightly sort of false way of understanding um character um they can be totally a, 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 it might be a, a, a too crass to think that uh, that experiences in the past can be so directly linked to behavior that it would it's too complicated of a web the past with that which defines us might be a, a through causality of the of of the, our past but it's a very complicated web of causality that we won't be able to that by saying something like i used to steal candy when i was a little boy and that's why i became a thief as an adult is just not the right balance right so like defining or 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 just single moments uh, in the past is to and so the the same way that as that character cannot be defined by by moments in the past because it's too complicated the same thing about storytelling that uh, that events that happen are necessarily linked obviously to what happened before because of the physical world and that's how it operates but it's also much more the web of that past is a lot more complicated and cinema in particular yeah i think it's very different to literature in this regard i mean maybe literature could function perhaps in a similar way sometimes but at, but but what literature has that cinema generally doesn't it could but generally doesn't is kind of like a reflection on that which you're seeing on the action on the material um cinema generally only has that surface the material world and you have to infer everything else in literature they have the possibility of uh, of less hearing what some all the characters are thinking having a narrator explain larger more complex things whereas in cinema it's a little bit more uh, uh, less less intellectual perhaps in that sense like you can rely less in the world of ideas and you have to rely a lot more in the world that is material and so those relationships towards causality become a, a lot more superficial in cinema because you cannot kind of uh, explain the the intricacies of 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 each circumstance that will uh, affect uh, the future both in character and in in events let's say Nico can I can I interrupt just of here course. for a second because it's interesting because you when you began um your your presentation and sharing your thoughts about fauna you actually you know you revealed something about your your choice of casting and the fact that you've worked so closely with uh, the uh, members of La Garpija Tira del Sol right the 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 theater group and you said that um, sometimes you wonder if you make films with them so consistently in order to kind of see where they are at that moment so that in a in a kind of meta way your the entirety of your film production could be thought of as a as a as a character study of those <laughs> of those actors right so i'm just putting that out there to kind of complicate a little bit your own yeah and, because this because, idea, you know what I mean? Because it's not, yeah. they're not just any. I mean, I understand that in the context of fauna of what you've done, but I'm also thinking about it in terms of your entire body of work and of how you presented it to us. 
Yeah, because it's it's quite actually central to maybe it's also all everything I've said about sort of character construction is linked to what you're saying because I also don't think too much about who these people are because I know who these people are and they're those people that exist out there and even the and and the, it is those people because in the sense that at the same time one can never define a person right so like it's not like and when I say it is them I'm not saying much because who, who are they well these complicated beings that are difficult to define at the same time uh, but in all the films and, and also that's why it's interesting talking sort of about this physical material world because if something is important to me is that it's them as their their bodies are the way they talk, the way they move, the, the little expressions. I, for example, it's very important to me how Gavino laughs because he has this ability of laughing on command, but not, it's not, and this is linked perhaps to what uh, Jeffrey was saying about Bresson and, and uh, uh, sorry, this idea I wrote down here. Uh, it was something being, being, being other than seeming. Yeah, being I suppose is seeming because when he laughs, he's laughing. He thinks it's actually funny to him. He manages to <laughs> to to amuse himself in that moment. It's not uh, I'm pretending to laugh, but I'm not. You know, so there is uh, a very direct capturing of someone's character at least the superficial level to some degree but also there is something about him like not everybody's able to laugh and feel laughter kind of on almost on command but can i can i ask uh, this idea of character development um uh how that works in a film like fauna it seems that uh, there's actually very little character development that that the 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 sense of where people come from like when they they the brother and sister arrive in the village and then there's the father you know and I spent a lot of time trying to figure out what you know what these two kids relationship were to this father you know which uh, and and it seems very mysterious in a way and uh, and then as we get to know these characters then suddenly they have transformed into uh, other characters uh, that are in a way still them but not them right so this idea that there there is a kind of repetition of them but they're 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 no longer the same uh, characters as as they were. So, in a, in a sense, my reading is that you you you're constantly foiling character development in that kind of traditional that kind of psychological sense, and that we're we're left to kind of you you fracture it, and then we're sort of left to try and piece together what is. Um, you know what these relations are yeah i'm interested in this idea that uh, that there is a journey let's say and you're meant to this i mean there's like a maybe i'm reducing uh, the idea of too much but this idea that in the journey one grows and one learns and one transforms and my idea is that that transformation and that learning process might exist but it's very difficult to observe and it's not apparent to the world or to ourselves and that as we go through things and move around and have experiences the the, the this process of character changing or 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 or, or the journey affecting us is operates in ways that is a lot more mysterious. They are very mysterious and that um, are, are more interesting to me left to the audience's imagination as opposed to kind of uh, be able to, for example, generate a, a kind of catharsis between the siblings that they come to an understanding about their growing up with this man or uh, or anything like that. Even, for example, Luisa has a very intense moment with, with the mother that there is these very heavy lines about 
about uh, the pains of the mother being transferred to the to the to the daughter and the daughter having to go through all the troubles that the mother went as a kind of kind of transference uh, uh, mode and even though they go through that it's almost like next it cuts and in this next scene they're unfaced okay. also and so because i feel like i mean i've had like fights with my parents and then the next morning you know it's just there and okay whatever and then you i'm sure that has some it has some influence in who you are and into your persona and, and your understanding of the world but it's not like next morning you just don't just go on like it kind of like it did happen and so on, but you know what I mean? Like, it's not like everything's transformed suddenly and now I understand. And because cinema operates sometimes in a way that it kind of tries to push these, um, these uh, uh, transformations. And I'm a little bit more interested in maintaining that distance. And then I like what you said about this kind of false, um, I don't know exactly how you put it, but this idea that, uh, that I suggest that something is going to, to, I suggest that possibility of transformation and then I betray that. that. And so I, I like have, knowing that there is some expectations um, with sort of fictional storytelling. And so by just not fulfilling those ex expectations, then you're automatically putting the audience in a strange position. And, um, and that's enjoyable both from a, like for for character and character development, but also for storytelling. I like that in the second part, the, the it starts as like a, this kind of the the promise of a thriller of a man coming to a town looking for a disappeared person and uh, sort of like narcos and the, the shot that was kind of these kind of like the hotel sign and and he comes in and yeah even started doing things that I would generally don't do which is kind of like this slide zoom ins together with pannings and things like that 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 suggest sort of like momentum and then he arrives to the hotel and then there's a towel that's missing. And so they spend like 20 minutes looking for a towel and it was my towel, no, it was your towel. And, uh, and these kind of very ridiculous um, uh, sort of comedy of errors that suddenly appears. And then when you think that comedy of errors is over, it just kind of comes back constantly. So the, 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 the towels, is, a, is, is at the beginning that he doesn't have a towel. So he, it's not so clear because you don't know this at, at this point, but the first shot you see him inside of the, if the hotel room, he's drying himself with, a, with his shirt. And so he dries himself with a shirt and then he puts it on. Then he goes to another room and steals a towel. Then the woman goes and returns that towel because she doesn't want, it. anyway, so it's one after the other. And then once he apologizes, she keeps trying to get the towel. And then once they're in the, in the in his room trying to figure out uh, this weird rehearsal space where he's gonna pretend to meet the where they're pretending that he's meeting the the sister then finally the, the woman comes with the towels and say like oh you know here are the towels so it's almost like the biggest threat like like what's continuously coming back instead of it being sort of a plot that is always sort of like catching up to you and and, and keeping you there it's these towels that have that is completely intranscendental. So by using the most untranscendental element as the as the device that keeps coming back mm -hmm. is a way sort of to to using as kind of technique, but on its but but kind of an, on the opposite direction. So instead of it being a like the thread being like this man that he's looking for and, uh, and trying to find him and always the name of Rosendo Mendieta coming in and out and the, it, it's the towel that keeps pushing in. Um, so, I was, uh, so I like this idea of, of using sort of techniques that, I mean, I, do, I haven't used it that much actually, this sort of thing, but I was, because I was thinking a bit more about narrative organization, I was trying to think about some uh, more uh, common techniques and then using these sort of more common screenwriting techniques but with other with elements that 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 seem kind of absurd for those techniques before uh, we move on to you addressing some of Lassero's um uh ideas i just I, I want to go back to repetition and mm -hmm. i mean in some ways 
Uh, this does have something to do with notions of character development and story. I mean, uh, the idea that, I mean, that in a way in the bar room, what is enacted uh, has to do with repetition when um, he, when Paco, they, they push him to perform uh, and he first performs without um, any dialogue uh, because he doesn't have dialogue. And then they say, well, do it again, but with dialogue. And then he has to sort of start all over again. And he does this uh, again and, and he finishes and then they say, do it again. And, you know, he, he follows, you know, starts to follow it, but they want him to do it slightly, you know, start later in the monologue and, and so on. But there's something about the, the, the pleasure of seeing it again and again, rather than moving on, that is very intriguing about um, the film. And in, in a way, the, when, when we go into the no space of the novel, that also, in a sense, is a repetition because it's redefining the the relationships between these people again. You know, there's something about the how they reappear in different as the same but different in e each of the the sections. You know, uh, that um, allows for a, a space to see things differently rather than, okay, moving on to the next and moving on to the next. Sorry. You're muted. Yep. Uh, there is, for a long time, this idea of repetition and, and variation in my films have been sort of very key. And it actually just started because of something that you mentioned, which has to do just with the beauty of repetition. Like it was not so much about the meaning of, of that it later kind of became maybe perhaps about the meaning as well. But there is something, first, I think there's something wonderful always about recognizing something mm -hmm. in general, that you are, that you see something that you know that you've seen before, let's say, and, and just that recognition, there's some beauty in, in, in that, uh, independently of cinema, I guess. Uh, and so to use that in cinema is so easy, right? Because it's just a matter of, um, of that putting two takes that are very similar together. Mm -hmm. And this is also a process that is so normal in the process of cinema because you do many takes of the same mm -hmm. thing all the time. And so I remember uh, with my first films seeing when I was not thinking too much about repetition yet, but having to pick uh, takes in the editing room and feeling like what became complicated sometimes about about picking a shot was that what made me like one shot more many times was only in relation to liking the other one less or to or to or to or what they did after watching the other one that it was in repetition that something was was interesting as opposed to in and of itself. And, um, and it's funny because it's something that we all experience as filmmakers constantly. Mm -hmm. And actors memorize these lines and they, and they rehearse them constantly in order to be able to, to say them. So, so the idea that, like for an actor, a, a text that they've memorized is drastically different than for an audience member that listens to it once, not only because you understand less of it perhaps, but mainly because the, the process of repeating it turns it into something different. I mean, I guess the, the easiest mm -hmm. perhaps connection we have with that is perhaps with songs and music, because while films we watch, maybe we can watch them three times, if I, that, that's a lot already to watch a single film three times, but maybe we listen to the same song that we like hundreds of times. Mm -hmm. And that song, when we listen to that song hundreds of times, what are we listening? We're kind of listening all those times that we've heard it before. We're not just listening to a song, but we listen to all the, the millions of times that, or hundreds of times that we heard it. Mm -hmm. So that accumulative experience is, I think, is exciting. And so there's a way of using that in, in cinema where you're, 
I mean, I've pushed this idea specifically more perhaps in other films where the texts repeat themselves identically over and over. And, and so to the degree that audiences memorize together with the, with the, with the characters, mm -hmm. the script, and there's something amazing when people leave the movie theater and, and, and know some of the dialogues because they've been listening to them uh, so much, like it's, they, they've, they've repeated so much. So at the center of this repetition of variation to me has to do with that, with this, uh, this awe that is generated by repetition itself. There's, yeah. there's also something else that's very uh, powerful, I, I think, around this question of repetition in your films. And it has to do one with, you know, speaking both psychoanalytically or in terms of kind of uh, politics. There's the fact that, you know, character or subjectivity is perhaps nothing more than the repetition of a performance, right? And in that repetition, one becomes someone, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and of course, you're, you're repeating and performing something you have seen, you have known, you're appropriated, you're changing every time, right? And that in that minute difference between the repetition of the same and the repetition a, a bringing in something new is the a kind of infinite space of freedom right That's on the right, one yeah. hand yeah mm -hmm. and then on the other hand i kept when you were talking about this repetition and the way it kind of works in your films i i couldn't stop but thinking of something profoundly banal this the, the image i'm going to share but it's of all of us have either either remember being children or have been around children when they're someone, an older person to them is reading a book to them and they get to the end and what do they say? Again, start again. That's and they right. memorize it and it start again. And the only yeah. reason they wanna start again is because that's how they learn. So, I mean, I'm bringing these two things up because I think they're related, mm -hmm. like to, to learn to be a subject or to learn to, to something about life that will build character whether it's within the field of, you know, within the realm of a film or in the world is profoundly linked to repetition. So anyway, I just wanted to say that, but I know mm -hmm. that there's Lazaro, la, there's many things Lazaro brought up. And just perhaps about that, that you just mentioned, Natalia, like it, it could al almost be like sort of a treaty on acting, this idea that it is through that repetition that you create uh, uh, a sense of who you are and mm -hmm. and and a, a sense of also how to move and maybe it's linked to also the Bressonian thing and and in relation to repetition because the way he directed he always talked about um not saying anything to the actors except very sort of um, uh, practical tasks and then making actors do the tasks uh, as many times as possible until they became sort of uh, naturalized and and this kind of idea of muscle memory and so like the, the possibility of thinking that it is repetition that generates this muscle memory and it's muscle memory kind of what we are you know that uh, the way we the words we use and the and the way we move and the way we even perhaps even the way we think has to do with with these patterns of of thought patterns of behavior yeah But well, the something else I wanted to add there, like, it, and it's something that for me is like very clear in Fauna is how performance becomes like the core or the center of the film in some way, because it's to some extent it's also a reflection on the ontological character of performance. Uh, not only in the sense of, Natal as Natalia was mentioning, the realm of like cinema or films, but also in, in life, and how through performance we can like construct or develop our identities. I think something that is so beautifully represented in Fauna, that it's really, of course, <laughs> it's, it's, it's hard to think about the film without uh, addressing repetition and performance as a main element in it. Um, but I wanted to ask you again, like to, you know, if you can uh, also go back to a little bit the question of, um, how uh, are you or why are you uh, approaching 
the uh, or are you representing these spaces outside the center uh, let's say like outside mexico the city of uh, ciudad de mexico and and also how to locate yourself as a filmmaker within or or how to not locate yourself as a filmmaker within a mexican and i will say latin american uh cinematographic tradition more more importantly than for me than not um locating myself like like this idea of the peripheral like of not be not making films in mexico city specifically because i also do a lot of films in mexico city mm -hmm. for me it's and it's the important part perhaps is has more to do with not revealing the not making a film about a whole but like a whole like a like a general whole but as but to make films about very um, specific places that you get not that are that only exist within the world of the, of the film so mm -hmm. the films do not announce a very concrete uh, geography uh, while they are kind of i try to tie them directly to whatever cultural space where i'm making them so the space is important i do not make the films in studios i go and i film in a specific place at the same time the place is not revealed so like um this film is in a mining town but you never see the mine mm -hmm. it's just kind of mentioned and there is very few shots where you can get a sense of the that universe it's all kind of very um uh, the 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 mise en scene is reduced to the minimum I can, so like it's a very minimalist approach. So when I make films in Mexico City, which I do often, there is never chaos. There is never like this idea of like lots of noise and chaos and people yelling everywhere and car crashes or um, or density or or all of those ideas that one would have with Mexico City are kind of um not there but maybe they're implied because because audiences come in with certain idea you know that you're in the city in mexico but then you're in an apartment so you're in a in a in a room you're not in the the metropolis and here in fauna you know you're in the desert because you get a sense especially from the beginning but also at the beginning my idea is create a disorientation of that like we don't really get to grasp the desert we get to there is not a shot from far away with a car going in the desert and we get like the nice mm -hmm. sort of view of these people going through the space or even like a shot from the outside and you see the car driving a along the hills or whatever. But instead you see something that is very difficult to be able to hold on to. Um, kind of as a way of making the films to exist in a, in a, in a place of their own. Mm -hmm. So they, they don't exactly happen where I film them. They happen in your mind. And then where I film, it just gives you enough little bits and pieces of something so that you can try to construct a, a larger space. Um, and perhaps I'm more, I was perhaps a little bit more careful about this doing it outside of Mexico City or whenever I film outside, but, but there's a, a general sense for me that, um, that films Occupy, create a space using whatever is there, but they don't actually capture a space. It's more like uh, you grab bits and pieces of something and then you generate something new with it. So you are relying on that, on, on that what exists out there, but you're not containing it or you're not, uh, um, what, what you see is and a, a, a true like a, a, what you see is an actual representation mm -hmm. of fragments not um, and particularly because I'm making the fauna was a political film to me I didn't want to sort of um, link the politics necessarily to this specific location but I wanted it to be a little bit more the possibility of of that universe mm -hmm. uh, so it is there is a specificity of the town within the world of the film, but that town is not directly connected to the, not indexically connected to the town mm -hmm. where we shot, if that makes any sense. 
Yeah, yeah exactly. That's what I was, uh, that, that's exactly what I was like pointing out before. That is how uh, I noticed the uh, difference in, in your filmmaking. Uh, if I think about many other like more indexical, political uh, cinemas from Latin America, uh, because that is this, uh, this location of the spaces, uh, but it's still, it, it is still political, it is still, but I will say that the political content goes in some way behind the formal content and the format becomes political and so on. Um, but but I, I was trying to, you know, create, the, create this connection uh, that is more like a, like a difference uh, with, let's say, a Mas Calante or other filmmakers. And on the same way, I, I, I think I forgot to mention this, but I, it reminds me a lot of regadas. I was thinking Japón, for instance. So how the this uh, in some way you are creating a spaces of utopia, or or like that. I don't know. It's it's not exactly indexical. It's not, but uh, is is creating a space of onirical or like um, I don't know exactly how to define it, but. It's not um, at all what we are used to see uh, in a more like traditional uh, political cinema. Yeah, th there is something um, paradoxical to some degree. Mm -hmm. It's like the, the most sort of directly political Mexican films, like the ones that are more like overtly political that the poster announces sort mm -hmm. of like uh, uh, its politics, let's say, are films that tend to be very formally detached from that which they photograph sort of kind of cartoonish and you probably don't know these films but they're very like for more for local consumptions like uh, like that movie i mentioned earlier hell and there's a movie called la ley de rodes and they're very mm -hmm. um kind of uh, very i don't want to say theatrical because my theater friends will kill me but there's something very kind of uh, where where a tree looks like the cardboard of a tree to make myself understood like there's something that feels so far detached from the actual material world so but in 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 the process of 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 being political everything is very perfectly arranged and very distant from that which is being photographed and at the same time creating the, the the facade that it's not that it is the actual thing and what i'm trying to do is a little bit the opposite which is i am i am interesting i'm interested in the tree itself and how the, the leaves of the tree move and observing the light how it falls and so on and those things and at the same time i want that uh, i want to sort of make sure to be understood that that level of indexicality that 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 film can maybe um, make you believe there is like you're seeing things as they are because film has this sort of uh, a crazy ability almost a, a magical ability of making seem that you have the thing in your hand by photographing it um, so to to take advantage of the of the medium that you're able to capture that light and those things and the gestures of people and so on and at the same time undermine that and say like okay but be careful with appearances because things are not what they appear to be necessarily that even if film has this sort of crazy possibility of indexicality at the same time we have to remember that there is a process of representation even mm -hmm. if we try to negate it and i think the whole the whole conversation about representation is interesting because a lot of uh, filmmakers perhaps more romantic filmmakers uh, want to uh, uh, eradicate this notion of representation sort of this idea that there is something pure about cinema and because of the maybe this kind of like physical transfer of the material world into in it was easier to explain, I guess, with celluloid into the sort of into this other realm. Um, and I share the enthusiasm towards this um, sort of romantic notion of being able to capture something. But at the same time, I'm always uh, very sort of vigilant of my of this kind of of being so enthralled by by the by this alchemic or magical process and remind myself that you are uh, giving a, a very concrete point of view on something and it's not the world is not this way and those people that you're photographing 
they are not your friends. They're still pixels on the screen and your friends are something else. So it's a combination all the time between, yes, those are portraits of these people and at the same time, okay, it's just like a, these are two dimensional images and, there, and I like the tension as well. Mm -hmm. Nico, can I, can I um, before uh, closing this amazing conversation and bringing it to an end, kind of bring back something Lazaro had said earlier um, and connected to what you just said. And, you know, Lazaro had pointed out that there seemed to be a kind of parodic, perhaps, relationship to this Mexican cinema around, you know, narco, drug cartels, etc. Mm -hmm. from your, if, um, in fauna. So I wondered if you could talk about that and if there was a relationship between this, whether it's parody or whether you call it something else or you think about it differently. And this, question of like whether you know do your films represent Mexico or Mexican life or are you a, is that what a Mexican filmmaker must do <laughs> no I mean I'm I'm always I'm actually but maybe it's a personality thing I'm always shocked at the audacity of of these films that represent the world and I always think about the kind of the, the level of security the screenwriter and and directors must have to create this very strong statement about the the the, the way the world operates within this medium because i understand someone writing a book about the the the, the, the intricacies of of a particular political moment because of um, because of the amount of you know resources you have when you write a, a book but sometimes when i watch films about that define more or less or try to explain uh, the way mexican politics operate or uh, or a uh, or a particular moment in, in mexican history um i'm i tend to be particularly when it's contemporary i understand a little bit more the revisionist idea is, is less troubling to me but the idea of like this is happening right now and you're making these this work that is that doesn't leave any other possibility for reality to be differently this is how you know if you ask google now like how did the the cartel la federacion uh, how was it created well there is you know three chapters in the netflix series that can explain to you exactly who told whom what and how they, you know, and how they operated. And obviously, for example, not to get too much into the specificities of that Netflix show, but when when anything the CIA is involved in that show, because I watched the first season in order to make this film, it, it's always I, mean, I always think like, how can they actually make a film in which the CIA are the good guys? All of the CIA are the good guys in this, and it's like the they're like the the victims actually of this corrupt next and you and you know given the history of the cia in the americas it's shocking that suddenly they they're like the victims of this thing and they're the ones that are being undermined by the bad mexican government and so on and the, and so even if yes you know drug dealers are bad people i don't know but even to that degree it's it's quite uh, it's quite shocking and so i can not imagine sort of like the screenwriters that went through that process and then the the you know the directors and so and also what's more wild is that these are not sort of american endeavors i mean these are like multinational endeavors in which the directors the screenwriters the actors are from are in this case from Mexico so these are not uh, sort of the evil people writing things for the for the other you know it's like uh, the kind of the, it, the justification behind this is also that it's um, it's being these are these narratives are being generated from within it's not like you know they were written in some Los Angeles writing board they're they're you know they're done by locals uh, under the umbrella of this multinational corporation. Anyway, so I, I find that uh, that 
And this isn't, the, the, I mean, perhaps I use the most crass example because that's the example of the film, but it happens to some degree or another in, in films that attempt to, to create a concrete visual of the violence. And, but sometimes, I mean, I'm maybe a little bit too critical when it comes to this, because even, for example, sometimes with, I don't know if you know the, the visual artist Teresa Margoles, who is really important and actually makes really powerful work, sometimes I always think like, do you really need to bring a wall full of bullets to the Biennale? And is that, you know, it's that what now the image of the, of the violence in Mexico, is this what it means? Is this, this, is, is this wall with bullets able to carry the complexity? Mm -hmm. so, so sometimes even, it doesn't have to be like only in this sort of popular culture narratives, even in, in conceptual art, sometimes I feel that, you know, some distant, I don't know, like, uh, or, or that it's also a world that is so easy to, to work with because it's automatically dramatic. And so, um, I mean, I saw something in a different subject matter, for example, and I saw some, uh, I was in New York recently and I went to a performance where there was this chorus singing. And so in the middle of the singing, they say, start saying Black Lives Matter. And it's like, no, it's so much more complex. Like you cannot just pepper your little performance with a little bit of politics and then suddenly it's a political work. Uh, you know, it's so sometimes, I, Anyway, I just feel that, and that's why my films end up being so layered perhaps, or, or why I try to be very careful with all of these ideas that anytime I'm suggesting some sort of bold idea about how the world works, I automatically try to undermine it in order to be able to create a space for reflection as opposed to, to have a statement of how the world works. Also because the film doesn't give me the enough, it's not the right medium to create a sort of a thesis of a particular political environment. Is the right medium to, to get things boiling, get people reflecting upon these things, but not in order to, to lay down sort of how things work, but also at the same time, you cannot just kind of throw a little bit of like mm -hmm. something or other and then silently be political. No? Yeah, I mean, this we return as we as we end this to something you said at the beginning, uh, which is, you know, representation is a responsibility, right? Right. That, um, it seems like you hold that uh, very close to you as you think about uh, your practice, not only perhaps and probably or I mean, we haven't talked about this in terms of all your films, but that would, as I heard you say that earlier, uh, this evening, I thought, oh, this um, is very much um, a possible definition of an ethos of work for Nicolas. Mm -hmm. I think you see it throughout the work. And, yeah, and yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I, this is something yeah. I recognized Im immediately in mm -hmm. seeing the work. And, and you've also, I mean, you're carrying on, uh, as I said earlier, I think a discourse that uh, you know has run throughout the history of cinema mm -hmm. these questions mm -hmm. and and that you haven't let it go I think is just really um, important and stunning in, in that way. So we are going to um, end this amazing conversation that could continue and as all webinars and zoom life events um this will end very abruptly uh, but i wanted to thank uh, well, nicolas for making this film and for giving us a chance to talk about it and to lazaro um, and jeffrey for agreeing to to be part of this conversation and um to everyone who is out there and who has been out there at different moments of this conversation thank you and everyone have a good evening. Thank you, Natalia, for Thank organizing you. this.